Hello, and welcome to the Bios Frontier Science Podcast. I'm Kate Shannon, and today I'm excited to welcome Sam Rodriguez, founder of the Applied Biotechnology Laboratory at the Francis Crick Institute. Sam, to kick things off, could you please give us a quick introduction to yourself and what you're working on? Yeah, absolutely. Um, thank you so much for having me. It's fun to be here. So um, I'm Sam. I, uh, like you said, I run the Applied Biotechnology Laboratory at the Crick. Um, I'm really an inventor at heart, so I did my PhD at MIT. Um, and, you know, over the course of my PhD, I invented a bunch of different technologies um, in, you know, biotechnologies, basically ranging from like, a, you know, a 3D nanofabrication technology called implosion fabrication, um, a, a, a spatial RNA sequencing technology, a temporal RNA sequencing technology, um, and got really kind of frustrated over the course of my PhD with the difficulty of spinning technologies out of academia. Um, and so rather than kind of following the standard path of going to do a postdoc, I instead um, went to do a, a stint as, a, um, as an entrepreneur in residence at Petri, which is a biotech uh, incubator in Boston, um, that at that time was still in its first year uh, with Tony Kalesa, um, who's an amazing guy, and uh, just learned with them over the course of a year, like what the process actually is for getting technologies like out of the lab, um, you know, and into the hands of people who can actually use them, right? Um, and so then after that, decided to go back to academia to, to found this lab, where basically like our goal now is to sit uh, at the interface between biotechnology, bioengineering, and entrepreneurship, on the other hand, right? Um, and, you know, we have this hypothesis that if we are inventing technologies, uh, but with like, like with a knowledge of how those technologies actually get out of the lab and like keeping in mind commercialization and translation from the very beginning, that we'll do a better job of creating, like, you know, inventing technologies that actually have real impact. Awesome. And so obviously application and commercialization is the focus of what your lab is working on, but are there any kind of common threads to tie the actual technologies that you guys are developing together? Because I've seen you guys are working on a ton of different stuff. Yeah, yeah, for sure. So, and, and basically I think that um, we're like at a, a, a point of transition right now. So, uh, you know, a lot of what we've done so far, and I guess a lot of actually probably what we're going to talk about today um, falls into the category of like contextual transcriptomics is like what I like to call it, um, which is to say these are mostly research tools, kind of fundamental research tools, um, which are aimed at allowing us to um, get kind of the same information that people are used to getting out of RNA sequencing information, um, but with uh, some kind of biological context. So, you know, for example, we're working on, uh, uh, so SlideSeq is one of the technologies I invented in my PhD, which is a spatial transcriptomic technology. So figuring out not just like what genes are being expressed, but where they're being expressed in the tissue. Um, Timestamps is a temporal RNA sequencing technology I invented during my PhD. Um, so not just, you know, what genes are being expressed, but when, right? And then also, I guess we're going to talk about the molecular uh, connectomics which is another technology we're working on, which is kind of um, aimed at like combining gene expression information or like protein localization with like a uh, connectomic information to figure out where in neural networks um, uh, different genes are being expressed. And so that's kind of the first thread is that contextual trans transcriptomics. But then what the lab is transitioning to more now, so some of our, new, our newer projects um, uh, is I would say more along the lines of trying to figure out how to use that kind of information for therapeutic purposes or for diagnostic purposes. So, you know, I like to say to people that um, we have now whatever five or 10 years of single cell um, RNA sequencing and we've learned a ton about the composition of tissues at the single cell level, right? And yet we haven't yet figured out really how to use a lot of the knowledge that we've learned about single cells for therapeutic purposes or for diagnostic purposes. And so, you know, we're working on, for example, a lot of cell type specific delivery mechanisms. So we have a mechanism that we're working on now for like cell type specific viruses. We have a mechanism for cell type specific delivery of small molecules and antisense oligos, cell type specific like uh, um, LNPs or, or kind of uh, non-viral delivery, you know, delivery mechanisms for genetic material. Um, so that's like on the one hand and then the other hand, um, on the diagnostic side is figuring out, you know, how do we use omics for diagnostics? So that means like new kind of liquid biopsy mechanisms and things like that. So, right, we're in a transition period now from going from the basic research tools over to the more applied tools, figuring out we have all this information now, how do we use it to benefit human health? That's awesome. So jumping into, you know, one of the first tools your lab developed. Um, so one focus is you guys are using a new technique to map brain circuits and gene expression to study neurological disorders. Could you give us an overview of this approach? 
Yeah, for sure. Um, so this is the one that I was referring to, the connectomics approach. And we, we refer to it as like a molecularly annotated connectomics, so MAC, um, M-A-C. Um, and, and basically, uh, you know, the idea here is that um, uh, connectomics is to, you know, the brain is like the genome project was to the rest of biology, right? So the connectome is like the fundamental um, uh, information that underlies cognition, right? And, and, um, and behavior. And, you know, historically, like the only technology that we've had for uh, mapping connections between neurons and the brain is electron microscopy. Um, and the reason for that is that uh, neurons are connected by these little junctions called synapses. Right, and synapses are so small that they can only really be seen by electron microscopes. They're actually too small um, for optical microscopes to see, which is to say they're below the diffraction limit. Um, and the diffraction limit is like the fundamental physical limit on what you can see with, a, with an optical microscope. Um, but what has happened in uh, the past, you know, um, uh, well, and, and so like as a result, I, I should say first, as a result of being limited to electron microscopy, um, connectomics has taken a very long time to take off, right? So like back in the 80s, we got the connectome for the first animal that we ever, you know, ever, um, which was a, a C. elegans, a nematode, a little worm, right? And that thing has, I think, like 302 neurons, depending, or like 380, depending on who you ask and what, what gender, you know, what, what sex it is, and et cetera. Um, and, uh, the next organism that we got a connectome for, the, you know, I'm, I'm missing a few, but like the point is that the next like real model organism that we got a connectome for um, it was uh, the fly Drosophila, which was like last year. Okay, so there were like 40 years in, in between, and we're still only at the fly. So you know it's going to be a long time, but like the current trajectory is going to be a long time. Um, uh, and even you know there's currently like talk about doing a mouse connectome project, but like that. Uh, uh, but like doing that project, it's like really, it, that, that project might, might get funded, but so it would be like one mouse and it would take five years, right? So the question is like, how do we scale, uh, uh, how do we scale connectomics up? How do we accelerate it, right? So that it, so that like we can start to get to the point where connectomics is like a normal part of your like your lab uh, kind of workflow in neuroscience, in neuroscience research, right? Um, and the insight here is that uh, historically optical microscopes haven't been able to see synapses, but now with the advent of super resolution microscopy methods, right, uh, which like won the Nobel Prize in 2015 or 2014 or something like that, um, and you know, Storm and, and Palm. And since then, there have been like a lot of other new methods as well, like expansion microscopy now. Um, the idea is that you can actually use these uh, super resolution optical microscopes to visualize synapses. Um, using, uh, you know, using, in an, using optical microscopes. Um, and the advantage of using optical microscopes for connectomics is that then you can do things like you can use molecular barcodes. Um, okay, so these are molecules that you can put into the cell, which then allow you to identify the cell uniquely like anywhere in the brain, right? Um, which leads to basically tremendous speed ups uh, and, and like it provides you with an error correction capability. Um, and so this is the kind of, so, so that's like the kind of overview is that we're trying to move from this very slow electron microscopy um, over to optical microscopy, which is faster and provides us with new capabilities um, to use barcoding and also to look at like endogenous uh, proteins and things like that. Awesome. So this technology essentially allows you to map the connectomes a lot faster and hopefully in higher organisms. But where do you plan on applying these maps? How do you plan on using these maps? Yeah. So, yeah, um, well, I think that, that, you know, the fundamental thing to understand about connectomics um, is that uh, the connectome itself, like an individual connectome, will probably have limited impact, right? In the same way that if I were to give you a text file full of A's, C's, T's, and G's with like no information whatsoever, uh, right, you would not really understand, you would not learn anything from it, right? Um, however, just like the ability to the so just like the ability to do genomics has transformed biology, the ability to do connectomics will transform neuroscience, right? Um, and so our goal, what you know, when you ask about like where do we want to apply this technology, really like our goal is to create something that would be like the Illumina for connectomics, right? Something that you know, uh, a, a technology that would be like fast enough and easy enough to use that like every neuroscience lab could have one of them, and then just like have connectomics be like a standard part of the, of the pipeline, right? Um, so what does that look like? You know, 
uh, you are trying to figure out, for example, like what is the difference maybe between like the very basic neuroscience side, like you want to know, like there's one species of fly that like, you know, can like walk and one species of fly that can jump, right? And you want to know like, what's the difference between them? Well, you know, today you might spend a graduate student like, you know, four years to try to identify like the specific neurons that are like different. And now in the future, maybe you can just do connectomics, right? On the more applied side, you want to ask like, what do, what does like, uh, ketamine actually do to the brain so that we can start to develop drugs that like mimic the effects of, you know, the antidepressant effects, but like without all, you know, whatever the, the uh, psychotropic effects that some people find to be unpleasant, right? Um, uh, you can go in and you can actually identify like what is this drug doing? So you can start to do like a more rational approach to drug discovery where you're actually like looking at the phenotype um, of the circuit and what effect does the drug have on that phenotype, right? Yeah, no, that's gonna be awesome because as I'm sure you know, developing neurological drugs has been very difficult, partially yeah. because we have very poor understanding how the brain works. Um, so what do you think are some next steps and future milestones for this technology? Where are you hoping to apply it next? Yeah, I mean, I think that the milestones, um, uh, this, this is like one of the longest projects, right, that we work on just because um, you know, it's difficult to appreciate, uh, I think, like, um, uh, it, it, took, it took people also, like, 20 years to develop the technology that they needed to sequence the genome, right? And in some ways, the connectome is even harder. I mean, you have to, like, imagine um, the connectome. The, the, the connectome is even harder, actually, because you only have one copy of it. Right, so in the genome, like I can go and I can like give you whatever a hundred million copies of my genome and like not care, it's just fine. You can have it, right? Like I can't give you my connectome because then I would be dead, right? So, um, you know, uh, I think that a lot of what we're a lot of like what we struggle with is is the fact that um, uh, these connectomics projects they are like in, intrinsically destructive. They are intrinsically right because there's only one copy of the connectome per animal. Um, they they require us to use this like um, these microscopy methods to see extremely small things, which even using super resolution microscopy, um, uh, you know, it's often not very robust. You often will like lose sections. There's like very very little margin for error. Um, and so in terms of like concrete like next steps and milestones, um, a lot of it is like. Uh, you know, really technical, trying to figure out how to build molecular barcodes that will provide us with error correction capability, trying to figure out how to integrate that with like new methods that are emerging for visualizing uh, gene expression. Um, uh, and then trying to get all of that to work robustly enough that it can actually be de deployed to map like entire connectomes. Um, and I think that, that one of the things here that I will, will point out is that um, Adam Marblestone and I wrote a white paper um, last, last summer um, about this, uh, these FROs, these focused research organizations, um, which was an idea that we had um, for, uh, uh, for a new funding mechanism, basically, for scientific research projects that are too big to be carried out by an individual lab, but that create public goods, and, you know, that create goods that are really, that really need to be um, uh, used by, like, the scientific community as a whole, and that, therefore, are not usually fundable in, a, in like a for-profit mechanism. And so like the FROs are supposed to be a, a, um, a funding mechanism that will, that will um, allow those kinds of projects to be funded. And I think that this is like solidly in that camp, right? Like this is a technology that's gonna take a lot of money to develop. It's a technology that is going to, is like not immediately gonna be profitable on its own, right? Um, and so it really, and, and it's a technology probably that like no individual lab, lab can develop. And so Adam has been working um, on, on getting some, uh, actually like trying to realize those FROs. I'd just like to give a shout out to him because I think that an, some organization like that will be really, really valuable and very important in this process. Awesome. I think we'll actually hopefully have some time at the end to talk a little more about these FROs and your thoughts on Great. a little yeah. more translational stuff. Um, but, for Mac, it sounds like there's still a lot of kinks that need to be ironed For out. Sure. But as it starts to happen, and you know, as we start to see more success with the technology, you know, how do you see this changing the way we study, diagnose, and treat neurological disorders? Yeah, um, it's a great question. I think that the 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 bottom line is like, um, 
the next 10 years of neuroscience, like uh, the thing that's gonna change is like the development of better models, um, I think fundamentally. So, uh, and, and that's basically what we need, right? So the reason that you have, you know, drugs that, that look good in your model and then fail in the humans is, well, guess what? Your model was, was probably not the right model, right? And, and, and uh, you know, you don't necessarily know what's, what about your model is bad, right? Which is the, that's like the hard part. Um, but the fact of the matter is that I think that using this kind of a technology and a lot of other technologies that we're, that we're seeing emerge, um, we're going to be able to uh, basically characterize the models that we use and characterize the disease phenotypes um, at a higher level of resolution. And then that will lead to us refining our models, which will hopefully lead to a higher success rate um, in, uh, uh, in neuroscience's drug development, right? So um, things like iPSCs, uh, things like organoids, can we build better models of the brain that way? Can we validate that those, that those are actually reliable models of the brain using things like connectomics, transcriptomics, et cetera? And then can we use those models to get a higher you know, translational rate from, you know, uh, from like lab to clinic? I think that that's gonna be the big thing. Yeah, that's awesome. We look forward to watching that technology progress. Uh, but moving on, another thing that your lab is working on is kind of this RNA sequencing, both temporal and spatial. Uh, so could you give us a overview of these two sequencing techniques? Yeah, absolutely. So, um, so this was like, uh, you know, the second half of what I mostly what I spent the second half of my PhD on, which was um, figuring out how to um, do RNA sequencing with spatial and temporal resolution. Um, and they go really, you know, um, uh, they go really well together now, but actually they start out in completely different places, which is like a kind of fun story about, about how science happens, right? Uh, which is that the two projects, they like, you know, uh, uh, RNA timestamps, which is the temporal project, was always actually intended to be a way to measure neural activity um, using sequencing. And then, you know, when we got to the end of it, we kind of realized like, oh, hey, like we built this thing to measure neural activity. But in reality, like we could apply this to measure temporal, like any kind of temporal activity. But, um, you know, the, the uh, uh, basically slide seek and, and, and timestamps, um, uh, the problem is that the methods that we have for RNA sequencing um, all rely on dissociating biological tissues, right? So um, either, so, so, you know, you're always doing basically an endpoint measurement. So it's all like they're destructive. So you're always doing, an, you have to destroy the tissue um, in order to either get the cells out for single cell sequencing or to get the, you know, um, RNA out for bulk sequencing. And either way, you lose the context, you know, of the, you lose the context in which the, whatever, whatever phenomenon you're studying was, was occurring, right? And so the idea here was, what if we could do, you know, single cell sequencing and retain the spatial context or retain the temporal context, right? Would we then be better able to actually visualize, um, for example, what are the interactions between different cell types, right? How do stimuli lead to responses, right? Like when do responses occur relative to when the stimuli uh, happens? Right. Uh, what? How does? How do like different like aspects of like the cell microenvironment determine both like you know which like where certain cell types implement different transcriptional programs? Right. Like those are the kinds of questions that we're aiming to answer um, with these technologies. And you know the the overview is that they're both like different ways of encoding um, of like retaining retaining that kind of information. So slide seek. Um, literally, we built an array that can capture a barcoded, spatially barcoded array that can capture RNA, right? So you take your tissue, you slice your tissue onto the array, and instead of dissociating your tissue in order to get the RNA out, the RNA that transfers onto this array, um, which is actually like spatially barcoded, and that so that that retains the spatial information um, uh, associated with the, you know, uh, with the RNA. So that's like the first that slide seek. Um, and timestamps basically figuring out how to use enzymes. Um, well, the, the core idea about timestamps is, is using enzymes to figure out, to record the age of, of each RNA into, into the sequence of the RNA, right? And so the idea is that if you know how old an RNA is, then you know 
uh, when it was created. And if you know when it was created, um, then you can figure out like what the cell was doing when the cell created it, because what was the cell doing? The cell was creating this RNA, right? So um, those are basically, that's like the, the general overview of the two methods. Interesting. So, you know, like you said, these two technologies provide additional context around RNA expression. Yeah. But what what is the advantage of knowing this context and how do you leverage this new information um, into you know new insights or what do you plan to do with it? Yeah, so so I mean I think that that's um, uh, first of all, what is the advantage? The advantage is like revealing is like all these new opportunities um, uh, for for extracting insight into, uh, you know, extracting like biological insights that you don't have when you dissociate the tissue, right? So that is things like cell-cell interactions, ligand receptor pairs, right? Like which, um, you know, when two cells are next to each other, which molecules are they using to communicate, right? Like these are like very, very, uh, if you wanna think about like T-cell exhaustion, for example, in the cancer microenvironment, just to take like a super, um, uh, like, you know, super concrete example, like this is, these are exactly the kinds of questions that you have to, um, uh, that, that like these methods will allow you to, to answer. Um, so those are, that's like the kind of advantages, um, uh, how we're leveraging it basically by collaborating with as many different people as we can. Um, the fact of the matter is that we, we are specifically inventors. So we don't, um, as much like, uh, you know, we don't apply the technology as much as we help other people apply it. Um, and we're always trying to invent new things. So I like to say that um, I've actually never published two papers on the same topic. Um, so, cause we're just always trying to do, we're always trying to do the next thing. But, you know, in, in collaboration with, um, uh, with like some of the other labs here at the Crick um, and, and elsewhere, some of the projects that we're, we're doing include, for example, like, um, Exactly that, like trying to apply it to the tumor microenvironment, right? And really learning, like, what are the what are the factors um, in cancer that govern the react the, the response of like uh, um, you know tumor cell or the response of like immune cells to, to to tumor cells? Like, what are the factors that tumors can use to shut down the immune response? Right? Like, it's a super important question in cancer immunotherapy. Um, another thing that we're trying to answer is, for example, like uh, in various neurodegenerative neurodegenerative diseases, right? Like how do, for example, like uh, uh, plaques that get deposited, um, how do they like affect, what are the effect that they have on surrounding cell, uh, on nearby cells? It's like another, another example. Um, but we've been applying it to a ton of really, really cool stuff. So like also at one point we were like applying it to like axolotl to figure out like what are the genetic factors that like drive limb regeneration, right? Um, a lot of what people want to do is things like a, look at uh, cancer evolution, right? So, um, you know, uh, how are different clones distributed throughout a cancer? So, you know, it, it's, it's that kind of stuff. It's really, really um, uh, cool. Uh, I, I think the areas where it can be applied to a ton of different areas and you get to do a lot of very cool science. Ah, no, those do sound like very cool projects. And so, you know, I guess moving forward with this technology, how do you see it evolving? And, you know, what do you see it being used for in the future? Yeah, I mean, I think that the thing that we would really like to see it get used for eventually is, is some kind of diagnostic, right? Where you can say, where you can like look at the tissue and say, uh, this is what I was saying before about how we're really interested in figuring out how to use these technologies to actually concrete, concretely impact human health. So, you know, we would like to be able to say like, oh, in cases in which, you know, cell type X is, um, you know, uh, cell, you know, where pairs of like cell type X and Y are like expressing such and such a ligand receptor pair, then you have to like give the give drug A. But if it's but they're if they're expressing like this other ligand receptor pair, you like give give drug B, right? So like, those are the kinds of questions I think we're um, uh, we're super excited about. We're working on a bunch of different new technologies, like new ways to extend um, the technology. So uh, you know, there without getting into into any of like the more confidential projects. Um, obviously, some of the things that we're working on are like figuring out how to combine it with like antibody staining, um, right? Which is something a lot of people are interested in. Um, figuring out how to apply it to like uh, FFPE, so like fresh uh, sorry, um, hormone fixed and paraffin embedded uh, tissue, right? Is a, something that a lot of people um, uh, would be really excited about because a lot of these methods basically they work on like frozen tissue as opposed to fixed tissue. 
Um, so those are kind of some of the things that we plan to pursue in the future, but broadly making it as widely applicable as possible, which especially means making it applicable to clinical samples. That's like what we're really interested in. Awesome. So moving on to the last project that we're going to talk about today, um, you know, your lab is developing new viral vectors for gene therapy. Um, and these viral vectors have reversible effects. Could you talk a little bit about this? Yeah. So this was an idea that we um, that I started working on uh, actually with uh, with Andrew Payne back at the Broad. Um, so Andrew Payne uh, is a good friend of mine from at Boyden's lab. Um, and we came up, so, so this idea specifically uh, was a way to inactivate the genome of uh, AAVs like after it had already been delivered, right? So as a way, uh, well, I, I can tell you the story about how this came back, which is that this was really a futuristic idea, which is imagine that one day, you know, you want to be able to like deliver gene therapy as, in like some kind of a um, commercial setting, right? So you're about to go, I don't know, hike up like a tall mountain and you need some like factor, you, you want like some gene therapy to increase the ability of your blood to like retain oxygen, right? But it's only gonna be like temporary or like, or, or actually I think like literally the example that we had was, um, imagine that one day you're gonna have a brain computer interface but it's gonna be optical, right? So it's not gonna be electrical with like shanks in your brain like Elon Musk, right? Like, you know, this is gonna be an optical brain computer interface where we're going to be using uh, uh, proteins that can report on your on the activity of neurons in your brain. We're going to be imaging that, right? And so then maybe you have like you know GCAMP twelve. It's like they're your protein, but then GCAMP thirteen comes out. You want GCAMP thirteen, right? Well, you want to shut off your GCAMP twelve before you move on to your GCAMP thirteen. And so then we were like, you're going to need a way to inactivate inactivate the virus. So that was like that was like a lot of these projects. They start out with some sci-fi idea like that, right? And then. And then we kind of laugh about it. And three weeks later, we're like, oh, wait, maybe it's a good idea. So in this case, the, the, the place where we thought maybe it's a good idea is that, um, uh, you know, like, I think with a lot of these, like uh, with, with gene therapies, they're permanent. And so um, there's like definitely some kind of a safety risk, right? Especially as we start to see more of these, right? Like if you put something in someone that's toxic and then it, it, it is, um, uh, you have no way it turned off. And so that was like the whole idea behind this, this project. And basically the idea was, that we, were, that we came up with a way to inactivate transcription like permanently, you know, to design the, the genome of the AAV in a way that would allow us to permanently inactivate transcription um, with a small molecule. So you would get the, your, uh, um, you get the drug, uh, you, you get like the gene therapy delivered, um, and then, you know, whatever, a week from then, if you were like, wow, this is really not working for me, you just like would take a pill um, and the pill would inactivate the, the gene therapy. Right, so that, that was generally the idea. Um, and, uh, but I also like to say at this point, like um, that project is still on the website, partially as like a signaling a way of like doing some signaling, right? So we, uh, that, that we're interested in, in, gene, in, in viral vectors and gene therapies. And we have a lot of other, other projects as well in, in the gene therapy space that we're really excited about. But yeah. Interesting. And so, you know, the ability to make gene therapies temporary um, you've gotten to some of the more science fiction examples of how that can change what we're going to do. But in the near term, how do you think that's going to change, you know, where we use gene therapies and you know, how we think about them? Well, I think that the, 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 the um, I think that the real, the question is whether you could use this as a way to, uh, reduce like the regulatory burden to make the regulatory burden for gene therapies uh yeah and wh whether you could use it to reduce the regulatory burden. and let me say that like this is actually a perfect example of the place where of, a, of an area where um the efficiency of research could be dramatically increased uh, by more communication between the various parts of the biotechnology pipeline, right? Um, which is that, you know, we had, when we started working on this project, um, we had this hypothesis that, uh, you know, maybe if the, uh, maybe if the, the um, uh, gene therapies were reversible, then it would be easier to get them approved. Now that's a hypothesis that as an academic, you know, you don't have the network necessary to go and validate that hypothesis. So, you know, often what happens is that you sit there and you're like, that's cool. That's a cool idea. Let's go do it. Right. 
But the reality is you have no idea whether that thing is going to happen. And so it remains a hypothesis. And I got to be honest that like we put that project on hold because, because we don't know whether it would, whether it would like be impactful. Right. Um, and so I, I think that that's, um, I don't know. I, I use this sometimes as an example of a place where it's like, you know, this is one of the reasons why you have to keep, um, uh, you have to keep people who are, who are, um, uh, knowledgeable about the pipeline who like work, it, it, if we had like a direct line to the FDA we're like I'm not in a in like a a, 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 a a position right now where I have a direct line to the FDA but maybe if someone at the FDA is listening to this it would be great they should reach out to me because you know if those kinds of connections would allow us to which are connections I'm trying to build right would allow us to dramatically increase the impact of our research and make sure that we're working on projects that matter right interesting so I'm not from the FDA, but coming from big pharma, being able to reverse gene therapies, I think is definitely something that could reduce the regulatory barrier and would be very interesting to a lot of people. Um, and so beyond this idea of reversible gene therapy and improving it on this AP side, what do you think are some other next steps for gene therapy? And what do you think the field will look like in 10 or 15 years? Yeah, I think the what the field will look like. I, I'm I'm going to be bullish about this. I think that um, uh, we are going to figure out how to how to reverse um, uh, how to reverse gene therapies. We're also, I think, going to figure out like you know we're going to find in the next ten years like a general a general strategy for delivering DNA to cells. If we're going to find a cell type specific way of doing it, we're going to find a way that is um, you know going to be not going to be blocked by the immune system. Um, it's not going to be perfect, but I think that we're going to find something that's a lot better than what we have. Um, and I think there are a lot of good candidates out there. Um, and if I had to bet on what the next CRISPR will be, I think the next CRISPR will be exactly that, which is going to be like a, you know, super safe, um, uh, you know, way of delivering uh, genes, a genetic material to cells in a cell type specific way um, throughout the body. And... Uh, you know, what? once we have that, I just think that there are gonna be so many opportunities. I mean, I think, uh, you know, and anyone who's paid any attention to, to gene therapy is gonna, will, will say there, there are gonna be so many opportunities to cure diseases, right? I, I think we don't even know yet. We have very, very little idea, right? Of like actually what the opportunities are gonna to be to cure diseases in this way. Um, because, you know, people think a lot about enzyme replacement therapy or therapies that are basically like, you know, replacing defective protein. But that's just scratching the surface, right? I mean, we're getting into the position now where we can start to actually like engineer new proteins, like, you know, from scratch. Um, and, uh, you know, when you think about like random diseases that we would never have thought of as targets for gene therapy, you're gonna be able to go in and start um, uh, actually like, you know, curing those, you're gonna be able to like design de novo proteins, right? That can go in and like, actually cure those diseases as well. So um, I, I'm really excited. I think gene therapy is really, going to be a really big area. Uh, I, I agree completely. And I actually recently wrote a article for Alix or for BIOS um, that went over a lot of these topics. And so I'm really excited to see where the field goes. And I think you touched on a lot of the key innovations that are going to be needed to really expand gene therapy beyond enzyme replacement where it is today. Um, but you know, moving on to our, our final topic and a theme that's kind of run throughout our discussion is, you know, translating biology. And so your lab's not only focused on inventing new technologies, but making sure that you, know, you find applications for these technologies and pathways to commercialize them. Yeah. Um, so what do you think are the biggest challenges in commercializing a technology that was developed in an academic lab? Yeah, a hundred, and this is like what I spent a lot of my time thinking about. It's a hundred percent the biggest challenge um, is solving problems that matter, right? And validating that your problems matter. So we tolerate, obviously in academia, we tolerate, we tolerate a lot of risk. We're typically doing like super high risk stuff, but I'll tell you that we do not tolerate risk when it comes to like, would this project matter if it is successful? Cause we, you know, we have so much risk. We, we tolerate so much technical risk that like, um, I, nothing feels worse than like solving an extremely hard technical problem and then discovering that no one cares, 
right? Which I think is like literally the majority of academic research um, is exactly that, like solving extremely hard technical challenges that no one cares about. Now, look, the, you know, talk about CRISPR, right? Like um, basic research is extremely important. And if the entire academic world were um, solving only problems that are like extremely translational and extremely, you know, relevant to like problems, you know, making solutions to problems that exist right now, I would be sitting here telling you, you know, we really need to do like some just like random research to generate, you know, generate like some basic research to understand how biology works, et cetera. But the fact of the matter is that it's way too heavily weighted right now on the side of the of the basic research. And there are way too few people focusing on how do we, you know, what are the problems that matter and how do we solve them? So that's thing number one is like, when you're in academia, it's just super, super, super hard to figure out which problems matter. Right. And actually, like, I really love talking to investors because, like, in some sense, like, your job is to know what stuff can be, like, what stuff people will pay for. Right. And generally, people will pay for stuff if it matters to them for some reason. So, you know, that's like some proxy for does it matter? Um, so I, lo I love talking to investors for that reason. Um, but most academics, like, they don't know any investors. I, I guarantee you, like, um, you know, most of my colleagues, right, they, they you know, know very, very few, uh, they have very few investor connections. Right, um, they wouldn't really know who to talk to. It's to figure out like, oh, I have an idea. Like, would anyone care? They don't even know who to talk to. So that's like thing number one, right? Thing number two is culture. And I actually think that this is something that um, I think you guys published an article like today, on whatever the um, the date that we're recording, which is going to be different than the date that it goes online. But the point is like, you guys published an article recently um, about uh, you know about how academic labs should structure. Um, can like structure themselves to solve like kind of translational commercializable problems. Um, and uh, you touch on this as well, which is culture, right? Which is just like making sure you hire people who are interested in um, really having an impact. Um, and that's the reason literally that I'm in the UK. So the Francis Crick Institute is, uh, you know, one of the UK's premier, one of Europe's premier bio, um, uh, biology institutes, um, uh, biomedical institutes. And you know, the reason I'm here is because there are very, very few people who think this way in the UK. And I get tons of extremely high quality postdoc and PhD applicants who say all they want is you know, to work somewhere where we think about problems that, problems that matter. And just like make sure to hire those people and make sure they're gonna be a good cultural fit and be like, you know, um, be intentional about what the culture is gonna be. Because then when you have like, you know, five or you know, six people in the lab, like I do right now, who are all thinking, you know, they have an idea and they're like, oh, but who needs this, right? Like, how does this help the patient? It's amazing, right? It's so cool to be like, you know, to have them in there thinking like, but, but, but how will people use this? What is the impact gonna have, right? And that's where the ideas come from. So um, that's the second thing. Third thing is build a network, right? So which goes back to what I was saying before, network with investors. So we actually have, I think that we're like the first lab that I know of that has an advisory board. We have an advisory board. I hold advisory board meetings three times a year and we tell them about the projects we're working on under NDA, right? And uh, that advisory board also includes some people who some academics would think of as our competitors, right? But, you know, they're under NDA and the fact of the matter is that, um, you know, they might be, they, you know, we, we trust them. And, um, uh, you know, and I don't think that academia is a zero sum game. That's the other thing. A lot of academics feel it's a zero sum game. I don't. The point is like we share, we share the things that we're doing with uh, other people. Um, and, you know, they tell us like we have, you know, entre like a person on, who's an entrepreneur who's founded a billion dollar company, right? will say like, oh, you know, this idea is fine, but like you have, you have this regulatory problem, right? Or like, you know, you have in, like investors who invest in, who have invested in like hundreds of companies being like, yeah, you know, I've seen things like this and like the problem they generally have is X. And like, we have no, we would have no access to the information otherwise, right? So I don't know, like academics, they're just like, tend to be very siloed. And the thing is get out of your silo, you know, build a network, form an advisory board, um, get other opinions. And the last thing, which is something that you guys didn't pick up on in your article today. So, so which I think is also really, what I really want to point out, um, the last thing is, uh, trans is like the translation team, right? Your tech transfer office, make friends with them. It's, it, you know, make sure that they know you, make sure they know what you're working on, um, make sure that you know who to talk to about IP, right? And make sure that you, 
uh, make sure that they do it well, basically. So like, you know, um, uh, you need to know them, you need to have their phone number, you know, when you have an invention, you need to call them and you need to stay on top of them about how, like, how do we get this IP filed, you know, validate that your IP is being done, your IP is being handled well, right? And, and work on socializing them from the beginning about spinning the companies out, right? So like, what is your university going to expect, right? Are the things that your university expects con compatible with the things that your investors are going to expect, right? Like, you know, let me tell you, like, not all places, like, there will not be a zone of overlap in all, you know, in all places there. And then when there isn't, you got to do the work. To, you got to put in the work to, to, to pave the way for the technology to get out. Otherwise, what's going to happen is that you're going to invent technology, paper is going to come out. You're going to say, hooray, my paper's out. Um, let's go do it. And there is going to be a giant brick wall. Right. So that's the, that's the third thing. Fourth thing. So, yeah. So those are a bunch of things that can be done on the kind of academic or principal you know, investigator side of things. Do you have any ideas of, you know, ways for people on the investor side to improve or help translate biology? So biotech companies, VCs, or other inter investors? A hundred percent. So, and I will say that like um, the, uh, uh, the, you know, I, I mentioned that I did this, um, uh, wrote this white paper about the FROs. Mm -hmm. um, uh, FROs is specifically, FROs are specifically for um, uh, intended to support things that cannot be supported by the by the um, uh, by by the private by the private sector, right? So specifically things that people don't want to invest in. Um, however, academic labs that are working in things that people do want to invest in, I think that the way that um, uh, uh, the way that you can like interface with the academic labs is actually like figure out how to invest in them. And this is like the next, you know, idea that I'm working on, next kind of white paper I'm working on, um, right? Which is that I think that there should be more sponsored research between investors and academics. And let me explain, right? So um, if you are an academic and you want to try an idea, the idea is pretty cheap, right? Like maybe you could, you could, you could like, test it out for 25K, 50K, something like that, right? There's no way for you to get money to try that in like a small room, right? It's not worth it. There are grants that are only like 50K, but no one's going to apply to them because you're going to spend three weeks on the grant and then, you know, you're going to send it off. It's going to come back six months later and they're going to say no. And you're like, well, that was a waste of time, right? So the point is like, um, uh, I, if there, there are, there, I think there's an opportunity basically for um, uh, investors to put small amounts of money in, to support projects that if successful would have real uh, translational applications in exchange for some, of, for some rights to the intellectual property. And I think this is a win-win because the academic can get the money and the academic can probably get the money in, a, in like a very quick way, right? Because the investors can be pretty quick about the way that they distribute their money, right? The investor can get access to the IP which means that they get like a right of first refusal basically on, on, on founding a company. And they can also get things like, you know, royalties, which investors typically don't think about, but guess what? Like if you have royalties, royalties don't get diluted, right? So I actually think that there are like some interesting financial models where, you know, if you're an investor, you invest, you get some rights to the IP, you get royalties, right? Um, and the third thing is that you get to pre-negotiate the license with the university, right? So what I'm, what I'm kind, of, kind of talking about um, concretely, uh, you know, I, I actually, I kind of want to just start this, this description again from scratch because like, I just feel like I went totally off the rails. Yeah. But, <laughs> um, uh, yeah, what I'm talking, um, what I'm talking about concretely is like, uh, if you're a VC firm and there's like an institution, a VC fund, and there's an institution where there are a lot of academics like doing research that you think is exciting, you can probably form a blanket, you could probably negotiate like a blanket sponsored research agreement with that institution, right? And then um, fund academics under that, under that blanket, get the IP out for less than you would get out when you ultimately license it, and also get some of the rights to the IP, which you can then monetize down the line, right? I think that there's actually like an opportunity there to build a model where you could really do for-profit support support like early stage technology research in a for-profit way, right? Um, and anyway, I'm really excited to explore that kind of thing.
No, that actually, that sounds like a fantastic idea. And I am looking forward to your wife. Oh yeah, God. I'll send it. I'll, I'll, I'll send it over for sure. Um, this is like, I, I started writing this last week. And so this is the first time that I'm talking about it. Um, but, uh, you know, maybe we'll include that in the, you know, whatever, six months or a year from now, we'll include that in like sec section two, like part two of the um, of, of, of this. But let's let's wrap up because I've seen one of my postdocs is actually walking back and forth behind my office. So I, he needs something. So yeah, we can, um, let, let's go on and we can wrap it up. Yeah, all right. So I guess to close things off, you mentioned a couple of things that you're working on. Um, where can people find your work or the white papers you've already published? Yeah, so um, basically we have a lab website, uh, which is appliedbiotechlab.com. Um, so I'm the applied biotech lab at the, um, at the Crick. Um, but in general, I think that if people who are, and so some of our projects are up on the website, um, in general, people who are seriously in interested should just contact me because a lot of the stuff that we work on is not on the website um, for you know, confidentiality reasons, uh, but I'm really happy to talk to people in person about it. Um, and then also, if you look me up, uh, uh, you can find all my white papers, uh, all the papers I've written before on my website, um, Sam Rodriguez. Uh, dot com, but it is it is Sam Dash Rodriguez, where Rodriguez is spelled with a Q U E S at the end. So um, it can be hard to find, but I've gotten enough permutations on that domain name that hopefully you can just type something in and it will come up. But you know, otherwise, look up applied appliedbiotechlab.com and you'll find out how to how to contact me. Awesome, and we've you know discussed a couple specific articles. We'll see if we can link them somehow through the podcast right. or through the show right. so people can find them easily. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Sam, for an absolutely incredible episode. This was a lot of fun and really great for your time. Yeah, of course. And also, just like at the end, you know, we also have postdoc openings. So if anyone is interested to do some entrepreneurial work, um, uh, entrepreneurial science, invent some things, spin them out, publish high profile papers, things like that, um, please get in touch as well. So thank you so much. This is super fun. Awesome. Thank you. Yeah. Bye.